we are um, entering into our final gate uh, today. Um, I know we have um, been going around. There's there's these ten gates that surround the uh, the the city of Jerusalem in the times of Nehemiah. And today we're finishing up, which is called the inspection gate. And I'm really looking forward to share with you because I feel that in in this word today there is something on this season and this time, and it's been on us for the last two years, if you haven't noticed. We are in a very serious moment in time in history. Come on, you believe that? How many feel that? You know, and if people don't feel it, I'm like, okay, okay. I'm just telling you as your pastor, there's, this is a Kairos moment. And so when we talk about the gates, we're, we're summarizing about the inspection gate. And these are the gates found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. Um, we have an entire book on those uh, gates. You can pick one up on the way out. $10 donation. If you can't afford it, just take one. It's good. But we want to help you understand the, the authority and power that come through the gates of Nehemiah. It's actually a protocol for prayer and a protocol for declarations. How many speak declaration over their lives? How many say things over their lives? Okay, people say you'll go crazy if you talk to yourself. You will actually go crazy if you don't talk to yourself. It's important to say things. Program, the power of life and death is in your tongue. Pastor can't say it for you. You have to say it for yourself. And this is one of the goals that I want to see. Everyone enter into a daily time of prayer, declaration, time in the word. It's the best way we can be built up in the body of Christ. Uh, this, this series has all been about James 4, 7. Submit yourself there to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's a two-part scripture, submission and resistance. We have to submit ourselves with our duty to pray and declare, and we also have to resist the enemy. We have, how many know you have an enemy out there? If you don't recognize your enemy, you will not do battle. And God is not in control. He's in charge. He's put mankind in charge on this planet. We are the ones who determine how things turn out. If we rise up and if we act, stuff will begin to happen. And when we look into the scriptures, one of the things we battle at the inspection gate, which is actually like the gate of destiny, it's the final gate mentioned in the book of Nehemiah, is we battle this thing called the spirit of timidity. Everybody say timidity. It's not the easiest word to say. Most oftentimes translators translate this word as fear, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. It's actually not the word for fear. The translation should say timidity. And it's this idea that what's making you feel small? How many know the church can't be small anymore? You and I can't be small. We are the new giants in the land. And this is where we have to recognize our call and our purpose as the local church is to rise up. We, we can't enter into our promised land if we see ourselves as grasshoppers. And we can't allow other people. They may think we're grasshoppers, but my Bible says one will put a 1,000 to flight and two will chase 10,000. That's what happens when we step up into our call and our purpose. So today I'm going to ask you to, to take a look at yourself. I'm going to call you today. I'm going to step on your toes. You're going to say ouch more than amen today. That's okay. First Corinthians says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. How many know it's important that we take a good, hard look at our lives? Come on, church. It's, we like to look at other people. We like to talk at other people's sins. It's so much easier. But it's our job to become self-aware. And can I tell you, that's freedom. That's such freedom. When I, when I realized that a pastor, that I'm not qualified to change any of you, I got free. My job is to change me. You guys are too much work. I'm going to be everything God's called me to be and focus on myself, and I'm going to let God move. I mean, I pastor, I lead, and whatnot. Don't get me wrong. I speak out when it needs to be spoken out. But ultimately, my job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. You decide to use it. Go for it. That's my prayer. That's what gets me excited. That's what makes Deb and I's lives come alive. When we see people stepping into their calling and taking down giants. I love it. So that's what we're about. And um, to be timid means to show a lack of courage or confidence, to be easily frightened. 
Come on, I'm going to give you that definition, definition again. The, the word timid means to show a lack of courage or confidence and to be easily frightened. This is not the spirit that the church can have any longer. The Bible says in Revelations that cowards go to hell. And we have to recognize I can't be cowardly in this season. I need to be bold. I need to be out and confident in declaring what God has said to declare. And this gate, it's interesting, the gate of the inspection gate, it was built by one of the goldsmiths. And I, I, I love the picture of goldsmith because we are really in a time where God is refining us as the body of Christ. It's, there's a fire that's happening. If silver is refined, gold is refined. And I love what they say about uh, when someone is working with silver. It says that the silversmith, he knows when the silver is purified, when as he's purifying it in the refinery, he actually sees his reflection back from the silver. He knows it's refined. Friend, let me tell you what happens. When God sees him, his picture, his self, his image in you, the refining is done and completes. And that's the goal that we're supposed to have, is I want to look like Jesus. I want to stand with Jesus. I'm not here to please people. I'm here to please him. And I want people to, I want his image to be shown in me. And can I tell you that a lot of Christians right now don't understand how to behave or how to act. But can I tell you, if you spend time with him every day, if you listen to him and you pray, God, give me the right people to listen to. Show me the right connections. Can I tell you, I'm just I'm like, God, I need to hear your voice because there's so many other voices out there and I don't want to be distracted. But when we get to this last gate, can I tell you, the inspection gate reminds me that we need to live for eternity. We need to live for what's eternal, not for what is temporal. That's why your pastor has told you many times that I would rather lose my job than lose my country. I'm willing to lose what I have for the sake of my country and for the sake of the kingdom. And this is where you and I, we have to join together and come together and recognize our part and our call. The inspection gate is the gate. It's, and we are in a time of testing and refining because God is creating a remnant of people. And they all don't look like me and act like me and, and everything is, is, is happening. But there is a group. How many have noticed there is a, a, the cream of the crop is rising up in this season? You're beginning to see people from all different denominations and calls. And even those people who may not even speak the, the Christianese that I like them to speak sometimes, that they are rising up and they're standing up in this season because where they recognize this is a Kairos moment. And I want to talk about that today about the Kairos moment that I believe we're in. And I want to look back this morning to September 11, 2001. How many know exactly where they were on that Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, when, our, when the, the towers in, in New York City were, were brought down? And you see, prior to 2001, there was much prosperity in America. And in that, in, in the, we, we recognized that our nation was blessed. I love what... Isaiah 30, 25 says, it says that on every lofty mountain and every high hill, there will be brooks running with water in the day of great slaughter when the towers fall. See, this is a prophetic word that uh, there's a, a man by the name of Jonathan Kahn had in, in his book called The Arbinger. Everybody ever hear of The Arbinger before? And he talks about what there's a parallel between what happened in Israel and there's a parallel that happened in America. And for us to recognize that there was something very significant about towers falling and New York City being a gateway to America. New York City has always been the gateway. And what Jonathan Kahn is teaching, people say, are you plagiarizing? I am stealing from him. I don't care, okay? It's good. <laughs> and he, he basically, we see that New York City is a gateway to America. And there was warnings that, that even in the Old Testament that took place, Deuteronomy 28, 52, talks about when a nation is disobedient to the Lord. It says, they will besiege you in all your gates until your high and fortified walls come down, in which you trusted throughout all your land. They will besiege you in all your gates throughout all your land, which Yahweh your God has given you. And it was a warning 
that when we forget the Lord, how many know America has forgotten the Lord? And we're not pointing the finger out at the sinners. We need to look at our own lives because we can make a difference. It's the time of the local church. And this is what I love about this season. God's just calling us to rise up. God's calling us to to have a different perspective of who we were to know our position and our time. And what has happened in our nation is, is we see that it began on September 11th. Jonathan Kahn says this, the gate is the entrance point, the, the portal through which judgment begins. Remember the biblical pattern. First comes the strike, the warning, and then a window of time. And what he's saying is September 11th was a time where God's judgment was released over America. It was, but it was a warning sign. It was a time where we had to wake up and then we needed to respond rightly. How many remember church attendance went up after September 11th? It really did. But it didn't stay up. I'm like, oh, I'm coming to church. Boop. And not that church is a measure of morality. Don't get me wrong, okay? Because it's not. But there's a picture here of the spirituality. And he says, what happens at the gate represents the beginning. What happened on September 11th, 2001 was the beginning, the entrance point of judgment. If the nation doesn't turn back, then what began that day moves in the, I can't say that word. It moves to the conclusion. Somebody else said in that one. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I put the accent on the wrong syllable sometimes, and it just it messes me up here. And so what's happening is, is that was a moment where we, we as a nation needed to wake up. But what happened, and this is exactly what happened in the history of Israel. So you see, during the king of David, Israel was one nation, but then two nations became out of that one. There was the the, the nation of Judah and the the nation of Israel. And so this was the northern nation of the the land of Israel. It was called Israel. And they were attacked by the Babylonians. And this is what the Bible says. It talks about that there was a, a season and a time where the Babylonians had come and they had struck one of their gates. And this was an awakening. This was what Isaiah was saying. This was a time to awaken. And towers often represent the pride, the self-sufficiency outside of God. We see this in Genesis 11.4. It says, come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its top in in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. How many know when the enemies of America came and destroyed those towers, it was, it was a symbol of our pride being destroyed. It was a symbol of our trust and it was something that happened at the gateway that we were putting our trust in. And we look at this and he goes on to say, and he said, so the towers of the ancient world were also linked to the pride and arrogance of the nations, kingdoms, and civilizations that built them. You see, to seek greatness and power and glory apart from God and in defiance of his will is pride. What happens in America is we began to trust in our own strength to rebuild and to recover instead of going low and say, God, you're right. We are a sinful nation. We need you. At that moment on September 11, 2001, this is what we should have done is humbled ourselves. And can I tell you, the judgment doesn't, if judgment begins with the house of God, it begins with us. So I'm not pointing the finger outward. It's us. But instead, there was this rallying cry that began to happen, and and it's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 10. And it talks about, it says this, The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. What happened on 9-11 and and following that was there was this this self-driven We are going to rebuild. We are strong. We are going to show the world that we're not backing down. And can you see that this is the trap? This is the the reason that we're falling. Interestingly, let me show you what I realized when Jonathan Kahn taught this. He said, so in the nation of Israel, first came the initial invasion in 605 B.C., This was the time that this was by the Babylonians. 
Later that same army would return and destroy the land, the city, and the temple. What was the time span between the first initial attack at the gates and the, the final destruction of the city and the temple? When did that happen? It was 19 years. Now I want you to think about what has happened since September 2001. 19 years later was prophesied that what had happened at 2001 was the initial warning and the opportunity to repent. 19 years later, the whole city was completely destroyed. I believe that what we're seeing right now is 19 years since 2001 was 2020. And we see that this is a Kairos moment for us. And that we are being weighed right now. We are being weighed in the balances. And those of us who are seeing this and feeling this, we need to be a voice. We need to continue to let the Lord drive this into our spirit so we're carrying a weightiness. And I have three things I want to share with you. That was kind of my intro, and it was a little long, but uh, I felt like that's such an important message. First thing I want you to fill in is time will tell. When we talk about time, this is a time for us to be urgent about the things of God. This is the time where we begin to see ourselves in the light which God sees us. And to be urgent means it's an immediate response to a pressing or critical situation. A number of years ago, I, I, I was listening to a ministry, and, and I recognized in my own heart there was a lack of urgency. And that convicted me. I said, Lord, impart to me an urgency right now. Impart to me the urgency that others are feeling. Does anybody else feel that urgency in your spirit? Yeah. And so I want that to be imparted. I don't want it to be moved of the flesh, but I want it to be moved by the spirit. And we as Christians should approach our vision, calling, and assignments with great urgency. Our job is to step into that place of our calling and to live it out to the fullness. Yes. And it's also to help other people do the same thing. Yeah. Help empower people. Help set people free. Acts 17, 26, it talks about that God has marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. That God has chosen a place for you to live and a time for you to live. And there are boundaries to both time and space. When we understand the importance of time, we have to understand the importance of urgency. And when we look at the Greek, there's actually two words for time. One is chronos, which is uh, systematic time. It's, it's chronological time. But then there's this thing called the kairos time. And it's the opportune time, or it's, it's the right, critical, and opportune time. It's like a pitcher when he pitches the ball, and the batter, he has to swing at the opportune time. If he doesn't, he will miss it. And I believe we are coming into that opportune time where we need to, we need to swing you know, it reminds me of the story of, of the little boy who threw up the ball in the air and he took a swing and he missed. And, ah, throws it up again. Misses again. Ah, throws it up one last time. Swings. Misses a third time. He says, man, I'm a great pitcher. <laughs> so can we step into this Kairos moment? The Kairos is the Greek word referring to a fixed and definite time, the right opportune time, specifically it is an appointed time by which must be seized or it will be lost. How many want to be ready for the Kairos moment? Yeah. I don't want to miss it. Yeah. How many of you and I, we can miss this Kairos moment? Yeah. And we have to be aware of that. And this is not like a fear thing, but it is a fear thing. Yeah. We have to have the fear of the Lord. Yeah. Like, Lord, I don't want to miss this. Lord, I'm prone to missing stuff. And I'm not going to say, boy, I'm a great pitcher when I miss it, you know. That's what some people, some Christians will probably say that. Man, I'm a great pitcher. I just missed it. No, you should have hit it. Okay. I love this quote. It says, you cannot kill time without injuring eternity. You cannot kill time without injuring eternity. We must come into alignment with our critical moment and our time. And can I tell you, there's, there's three things that you and I need to recognize. The first is 
we need to realize that we have a gifting. I think I have a chart up there that talks about the three things that, that we have. It begins with the giftings. You know, God has gifts for each and every one of us. And these gifts are part of what, how we fulfill our destiny. And we should continually seek God, uh, what is my gift? Now, if I believe, you know, hey, I'm the next Esther, I've got the best looks around, if I believe that and it's not my gifting, and it's not, unfortunately, my wife thinks so, but reality is I'm not going to be the next Esther. I can't fall back on my modeling career, okay? It's just not going to happen. But there are other people who have the gift of beauty, that they're just, or they have the gift to work with their hands. They have the gift of music, and it's been prophesied. How many have been prophesied over that they, somebody prophesied what they would be doing? Somebody, a prophet, spoke that over them. We're going to take time to do that after service today and prophesy over you. But to know what your giftings are, is it, is it a gift of music? Is it a gift of influence? Is it a gift of, of management? Whatever your gift is, discover it. The next thing we need to discover is our skills. Like, God, you can have a gifting, but if you don't invest into those skills, and that should be right there. There's a little next slide, I think. There we go. Well, there they all are. That's good. Okay. We'll just leave it all up. So we have our giftings, and then we have to also invest in our skills. We have to get trained and mentored. Uh, it, and it's whether you're a, a musician or a doctor or a construction or whatever you are, you have to take time then to develop those skills and get around people who are doing what you need to do, learning from them, submitting yourself to them. And a lot of times we don't put ourselves around smarter people because we get intimidated by them. And that's a, that's a problem. If you're the smartest person at your table, you're at the wrong table. Find another table. Get around people that are smarter than you. Don't feel small. I put myself around people that are doing so much more and such a better job. And I'm like, teach me. Show me. I've got a group of people. i got a lead here in Richmond. They're a lot of work. They need a lot of help, God. <laughs> right? These guys, these people here need professional help. Lord, don't leave me without help. And so, like, God sends me people that I can learn from. But I have to get my gifting right, and I have to develop my skills. And thirdly, this is where a lot of people miss it. They don't have the character. We have to always stay with character. Some of us, we get a level of success, and then we think we can just throw character out the window. That doesn't work in God's eyes. That's a Leviathan spirit. We've talked about that before. But we have to have character. Otherwise, what happens is, is we'll never fulfill our destiny. And what happens is, is when you, when you maximize all these three things, it's called, uh, Lance Wall now said this, it's called the convergence point. There's something where, boom, like, I like that. Thank you. Whoosh. You know, there's a convergence point when you're able to develop all things. Is this helpful for you guys? Uh, and this is something that we step into. Convergence happens when the work you do is the work you were created and called to do. That's what happens. You enter a role that frees you to utilize 100% of your gifts, talents, and acquired skills. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said this, Each second allocated to us is pregnant with divine purpose. Time being so precious that God deals it out only second by second. Once it leaves your hands, your power to do with it as you please, it plunges into eternity to remain forever what you make of it. I believe we're stepping into a Kairos moment, and you and I need to begin to become very aware of what God has called us to in this season. Number two, we talked about that time will tell. Number two, I want to talk about the rise and fall that God himself has called us to be the cause, the rising and the falling of many. This is what was prophesied over Jesus, that he was destined to cause many to rise, but many to fall. How many know that there are some people in government right now that need to fall? Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is what I'm rising up for in this time. I want to bring some people down. This is, what, this is what I'm destined to do. So Christians right now, they're like, it's just... Pastor, we need to be nice. Just put our heads down, and everything's going to go back to normal. No, it won't. It's not. We have to step up and rise up in this time and let the people that need to fall, fall. But if we don't step up, 
who is. So this is our season. There was a king by the name of King Belshazzar. And one day he was giving this great banquet and thousands of his nobles were there and they were drinking wine and he brought out all the uh, cups and the, and the bowls from the temple. And the Bible says in Daniel 5, suddenly the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster wall near the lampstand of the royal palace. And the king watched the hand as it wrote. And his face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. How many know that King Belshazzar faced his appointed moment? How many, how many are praying that this will happen again to some of the wicked leaders right now that are controlling and spewing their evil and their wickedness in the land? So he saw the writing on the wall. It says his knees were knocking. Interesting. I'll, I'll tell you a story. There was once this famous British captain, and he had his own ship, and he was traveling the seas hunting pirates, and he had a new uh, sea captain that he was training, and he was trying to train this new sea captain of how things operate, and um, one day they were traveling along, and they were a military ship, and were very good at what they did, and they saw two pirate ships coming their way, and the captain of the ship, he said, <clears throat> sea captain, please get my red shirt. He's like, Okay, so he goes and gets his red shirt. They put on the battle, and boom, you know, the, the battle is won, and the, the, the ship captain is all happy. And, and uh, the, the sea captain says, why, why, did, why did you go with the, the red shirt? And he says, son, if uh, they're in the midst of battle, men see me bleeding, they will lose heart. And so the man was like, oh, okay, the sea captain, I learned that. Well, the next day they're traveling along, and they see 12 pirate ships coming their way, way. And the sea captain looks at him and he says, get me my brown pants. <laughs> now, why did I tell you that? So I was reading the journal of biblical review. I was reading the top journal for biblical review. And they talked about this Belshazzar's response to when he saw the writing in the wall. His knees weren't knocking. He needed brown pants at that point, okay? <laughs> that's, that's what the biblical journal of biblical review says. But that's what's going to happen is, is people are going to recognize that their days are numbered. And we have to stick with the one who we know is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's for us. He's with us. And he, you know, Belshazzar, he had to go find somebody. I changed the pants. And they had to find somebody to get to interpret that. And there was Daniel who interpreted it. And basically, the, the interpretation is God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. This is a Kairos moment. God's weighing us. And this is the season where... We are being self-aware and saying, okay, God, we begin to seek him and say, Lord, what's my purpose? What do I need to develop in my life right now? And Lord, work on my character, Lord. I want to be a person of character because you're attracted to character. I'm attracted to comfort. How about you? But God loves character. Oh, sometimes I can't, can't you just love comfort here, but he wants character. And so it's time that we, you know, let me give you the final point here, is we need to obey the call. Time, we need to look at time differently. We're in a different moment. How many agree we're in a Kairos moment? Yeah. We're in a Kairos moment. There's a time for everything that Ecclesiastes 3 says. You know, it's part of that that says there's a time for peace, but also said there's a time for war. Ecclesiastes said there's a time for love. That's nice. Like, that's what a lot of Christians want. It's just a time for love. And then the next verse it says, but there's also a time for hate. So how do you know what time it is? You got to spend time with Jesus. Could I be getting this time wrong? People say, Chris, I think it's a time for unifying. Well, I, I'm like, if we're not coming together, if we're not in agreement, we can't walk together. We can't. We have to know the time and the season. The tribe of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel, it talks about all of the gifts that, were, that each tribe had, that some were good at archery, some were good at, at swords, but the tribe of Issachar knew the times and the seasons, and that was a weapon of war. Do you know the time and the season? 
If you do, you're ready for war. But there's many people who don't know the time and don't know the season and don't listen to them. So we have to obey the call. Everybody will say, obey the call. As I've been studying uh, the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament and seeing Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. We have to obey the call, and he has, he has given us the picture. Jesus has given us the ultimate picture of what it means to serve, what it means to serve the Father. Because Jesus laid it all down. He, it was t- so many of us, we spend, Jesus spent 30 years getting prepared and three years in ministry. How many know most preachers spend three years getting prepared and 30 years in ministry? Maybe we need to do it the other way around. So some of this might be backwards, but when we look to Jesus, we discover Jesus in the Old Testament. Can I tell you a scripture that blew my mind? John 12, 41. This is going to blow your mind. It says this, Isaiah, I may know the book of Isaiah. Isaiah lived about 700 years prior to Christ. And it says this, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. What? Isaiah, 700 years ago, prior to Jesus' birth, it says he saw Jesus' glory and he spoke about him. Isn't that fascinating? So I believe, I believe it could have been Isaiah 53, but I also believe it could have been Isaiah 6.1 when it talks about In the year that King Uzziah died, it says, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So many people like myself, we actually believe that Isaiah saw Jesus prior to Jesus coming to the planet. And when he saw him, it's interesting because it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah in Scripture represents someone who does good things but becomes prideful about it. Uzziah represents a king who did great things for God, but it turns into pride and self-reliance instead of humility and reliance on the Lord. I mean, no, that's, not a, that's not a good plan. Isaiah's, Uzziah, Uzziah's life did not end well because even though he had done good works for God, it resulted in his pride But the Bible says in the year that he died, and I believe when the church dies to its good works and its pride over what is accomplished and begins to humble itself before the Lord, becoming a dependent bride on their groom, that the glory of God was going to come again. This is what I believe the reason why this happened in the year of his death. So we see... The word Adonai in Isaiah, it says, in the, it says, I saw the Lord or I saw Adonai. It's often the term, the, the title that Jesus takes in the New Testament. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Adonai. I believe that this was the moment that Isaiah saw it to him. And I, I, when he saw him, and listen to Isaiah's response. He, doesn't, he says, woe to me. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. I mean, no, that, that feels like us today. That we, we are, we're crying out to God and we're recognizing that we need a cleansing. Can I tell you one of the first things I do every morning is I invite the blood of Jesus to cleanse me. You need a spiritual cleansing every day in this world. The blood of Jesus provides that for you. We had uh, a number of people, we were doing ministry uh, at the fair, and that's every time after we're done, that because of the attack that comes and because we're dealing with so much uncleanliness, we have hundreds of people coming in, and we're just like prophesying over people. But one of the most important things, because we've seen this happen, where if we don't cleanse ourselves after this event, people get sick, people end up in the hospital, car accidents, crazy stuff. So we're always like, Lord, I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So it's so important that you recognize your need for cleansing. Every day, you get around people. Things are said. You're on Facebook, (laughs) right? Things are said, cleanse me, Jesus. Cleanse me by your blood. And then forgive everybody that has done you wrong that day or the day before. 
It's one of the most practical ways that you can stay close to the Lord because he's cleansing you. He's cleansing you. And Isaiah's crying out, woe to me. He says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. See, this is, this is our heart, is that we have a picture. We get, a, we get to see Jesus. We get to see the Lord. And we're so embraced that we, we know our need for cleaning, cleansing. And then this is such a beautiful picture on Isaiah 6.6. 6. I may have heard the song, you know, take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. It's like such a pretty song. Take me past the outer court. We're all like worshiping and pressing in. Are you kidding me? There's an angel grabbing with the tongs a burning coal to touch your lips. Ah! <laughs> I gotta be scared of that, you know? Come on. <laughs> Cleanse my lips. Here's the tongue. Ah! Like, I don't know. I'm just not, I'm not feeling like, here I am. I'm not feeling. I'm just not feeling that, just to be honest. So that one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand and he had taken with the tongs of the altar. How many of you, when you encounter the Lord, it's not a pretty experience? You know, Brian Simmons, who will be here in a few weeks, he'll tell you about his encounter he had with Jesus. He said, Jesus showed up one morning during his devotion time, walked through the wall. He wasn't saying, more, Lord, more, more. He said, he started saying, less, God, less, less. Because his presence was, he said, I felt like I was going to die. When he encountered the Lord. The new prayer for the church is going to be less, Lord, not more. When we truly encounter the Lord, how many are waiting for that day? That's what I want. Where he shows up and his presence overwhelms us. So the coal is taken. And it says this in Isaiah 6, 7, and 8. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. He saw the Lord. We need to see Jesus. We need to see the work that he did. If you read Isaiah 53, the Jewish people will not read that in synagogue because it sounds like the New Testament. It talks about the crucifixion that Isaiah himself prophetically went forward in time, however that works and saw it take place. But we have to have a, a, a revelation of the cleansing that comes, the fire that burns because of what Jesus has done for us to cleanse us and to make us whole. And it, what has happens, it says, I've touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is toned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for me? And he said, Hanani, which in Hebrew is, here I am, send me. But you and I, as a church, we have to encounter the awesomeness, fear of God, the burning coal on our lips. And we need to know our sin is forgiven, our guilt is paid for, and then we can walk in the fear of God because we've encountered him. And when you have the fear of the Lord in your life, it crushes the fear of man. It's so beautiful. Because the fear of the Lord will be a snare, or the, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but the fear of the Lord will crush every other fear. How many think Isaiah had his fear of man crushed that day? When the burning coal touched his lips. That'd be a good encounter. And when that happens in our life, it transforms us. But this is what the Lord wants to do. Are you guys feeling lovey and warm and rainbows and unicorns and fluffy clouds today? No. But it's so good for us to have that encounter. It changes us. Come on, how many have had an encounter with the Lord and it changed you? Radically changed you. You were going one direction and you encountered the Lord and boom, your life was changed. It happened to me when I was 18 years old. I was raised in a Catholic church, but I was living a moral life, a drunken life, partying at school, and one day in my dorm room, minding my own business, I had an encounter with God that I couldn't even put words to. I began to shake. 
I tell people I felt like I was driving down a road on a, and I hit a patch of ice. I had that feeling of like, <gasps> I felt like that for hours. I said, what's wrong with me? Did somebody drug with me? I have no concept that there was even a God necessarily. But that day on, it was an encounter that changed my life that I knew I would begin to respect Christians and I would start to listen to Christians instead of mock them. Because Christians used to preach out in front of the, the, the school buildings and I would mock them and laugh at them. After that encounter, I was like, hey, you guys are doing a great job. Good job. Keep it up. Years later, I became one of them. I never needed a church to preach. If I, if I didn't have a church, I'd just go up preach in front of a school building. Wasn't very good, probably, but you, we did it. But that's the encounter that I had. And can I tell you that there was a cost to that, but it was so worth it. And he invited me into that journey and that relationship. And God's still, like, working in my heart. And I want those encounters continually because we need those. And I love other people that are having encounters. I'm like, come share your encounter. We just heard one encounter of this gal who was a Satanist and in a satanic band praying for a, an intimate relationship with the devil, writing lyrics, summoning Satan to come and, into their meetings. Got a radical encounter with Jesus. And she's changed. Like, we got another one. The devil lost another one. Oh, you know, I love those stories. Yeah.